Colossians 3, verses 16 and 17. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. We'll sing victory in Jesus. If the words are not up there, I'll just sing really loud on the verse, and you can join with me on the chorus. Let's stand together and sing victory in Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from Save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing again and cause the blind to see and then I cried to Jesus come and heal my broken spirit and somehow Jesus came and brought me the victory oh victory Jesus my Savior glad that you are here today, and I'm glad that we are all here. i um, grateful that uh, somehow we escaped this weather pattern and uh, that the uh, National Weather Organization, whatever they're called, didn't scare us away this week. But uh, we're just uh, glad to be together, glad to have our first service and our second service, and those who are, are going to be watching us online later, we just praise God for uh, the fellowship here at Quaker Gap. And I want to welcome you to our time of worship. There are just a couple announcements I want to make. I think most of our Sunday school classes I heard were taking off, at least the one that's meeting today, for Valentine's Day. And uh, so Monday night class meeting. The Monday school class is still on. 
And uh, so uh, if you want to join a Sunday school class, feel free to join any one of them. Call the church office if you need more details about those classes. And uh, I want to remind you that this Wednesday evening, we are going to be having our Wednesday evening meal. We're having oven-baked chicken breast, green beans, au gratin potatoes, bread, and dessert. And you can uh, contact the church office if you plan on picking up a meal or two or three. And uh, stop by between 5 and 6.30, drive through to pick up those meals. And uh, we'll be glad to serve you. And looking forward to uh, seeing your smiling faces as you pick up those meals on Wednesday evening. Our youth group meets Wednesday from 6 to 7. And um, our children today are over in the Fellowship Hall for Children's Church during this service. And so uh, we're trying our best to continue to uh, minister to folks as we can, as the Lord allows. And I'm glad that you're here today. And uh, let's bring this service before the Lord and dedicate it to him. Heavenly Father, we welcome your presence here today where two or three are gathered in your name. There you are in the midst of them. And so we are glad to have you present with us. Lord, as uh, we open your word, I pray that we would hear your voice clearly this morning. As we lift up our praises, I pray, Lord, that your name would be glorified and that you would be pleased with our time of worship. Uh, Father, lead us, guide us, and direct us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we continue in our worship, I'm reminded of in our Christian walk, we're um, living out our faith day to day, and sometimes we're not sure exactly um, where we're going, and, and the things that are happening to us can be um, uh, discombobulating, because I can't think of any other word to say other than that at the moment, but uh, the words to this hymn, Trust and Obey, uh, is just such a testimony of the, of the, the great truth that no matter what we face in our lives, we can trust and obey him to sustain us uh, through the glory that he provides for us along the way. Let's stand together and sing these words to this great hymn, Trust and Obey. When we walk with the
trust and obey, or let's go our own way to be happy with Jesus, but to trust and obey. You may be seated. Our scripture this morning is Psalm 27, and we're going to be focusing on verses 1 through 3 in the message, but let's read the whole psalm this morning, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not hand me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Mm. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are worth waiting for. Mm. How we praise you and thank you that you are a faithful God, a trustworthy God, Mm -hmm. a God in whom we can have complete confidence. We thank you this morning for the love that you have shown us through your son, Jesus Christ, that you gave us your son, that he died on the cross in our place, taking away our sins and giving us hope for all eternity. We praise you and thank you for the good news, the truth of the gospel, that you love us so much that you have done this for us. We praise you and thank you, Lord, that we can trust in you and walk with you each day, that no matter what we face in this world, Lord, that our relationship with the living God gives us great confidence. Today, Lord, we want to pray for our church family. We pray, Lord, for those uh, who are ill, those who have had recent surgeries. We pray, Lord, for uh, their strength and healing and ask that your hand would be upon them. Father, that uh, they might return to fellowship soon. We also want to pray, Lord, for those who are uh, discouraged, who have had troubles in their life. We lift them up to you, Father, and pray for comfort. We pray, Lord, that you would help us as a church family to to lift one another up, to encourage one another, to love one another, as you have called us to do. Father, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to look at the needs of our world and to apply your love to it liberally. Mm -hmm. Father, that we might love those around us as Christ would love them. Lord, we want to pray for this nation that is divided uh, by uh, so many uh, competing mindsets and policies and politics. Father, we know that there will be no peace until all love you and serve you and look to you. So, Father, help us as your body, your church, here in Quaker Gap and across this country and across this world, Lord, to put you first, that you might be the priority and that we might experience true peace in days to come. Lord, uh, thank you for your presence here with us. And as we continue in worship, we pray, Lord, that uh, your name would be lifted up. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Talk 
darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. A God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I Back in 1952, Norman Vincent Peale wrote a best-selling book entitled The Power of Positive Thinking. It was the start of a movement. Uh, Peale's thesis was this, that optimism is a healthy way of life and can be achieved through visualization and affirmation, positive thoughts. By saying the right things over and over again and believing them in your mind, you can change your attitude, and you can change your life for the better. So Norman Vincent Peale was a pastor in New York, and so he included many biblical thoughts throughout his book, and he advised repeating scriptures like mantras. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, who can be against us? Ten times every day. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
over and over again throughout the day. You know, many have followed in Norman Vincent Peale's footsteps. Just need to go to your bookstore to the self-help section, and you will see self-help gurus like Tony Robbins and Deepak Chopra and Eckhart Tolle and Oprah's favorite, Wayne Dyer, who wrote Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. Turns out that uh, positive thinking also brings in a whole lot of money uh, as well. And uh, this has even spread to the Christian community. Mega church TV preacher Joel Osteen has written books like Think Better, Live Better, A Victorious Life Begins in Your Mind. And you can, you will, eight undeniable qualities of a winner. And what Osteen has become famous for is taking his Christian beliefs, marrying them with positive thinking. Uh, I believe that there's something to be said for positive thinking, for sure. Optimism is a godly virtue. Hope is a Christian character trait that is encouraged throughout Scripture. And I do believe that a positive outlook is a healthy way of life. However, however, you may have heard that coming, we need to be careful that our positivity is not just some sort of pie-in-the-sky Pollyanna fantasy. Uh, the truth is that we live in a world that is ruled by evil. We mustn't forget that. We live in a world filled with evil doers. We know that negative stuff happens all day long. Just look at the news. And we know that perhaps one of our greatest enemies is that man or woman that looks back at us in the mirror in the morning. It is easy to get down in this world, especially during a pandemic. Uh, every day it seems like I hear new strains of the pandemic coming. I'm not sure whether there are new strains or whether they're just reporting the same new strain over and over again. I haven't figured that one out yet. But more bad news every day. And when I hear about the new strains, the first thing I do is I check... I wonder if this vaccine is going to cover that new strain. And then the other day they said, you know, uh, wearing one mask is good, but two masks is better. So let's just start layering up masks. The more, the better. Um, so the news just keeps coming. Our positivity, our positivity is important. There is no doubt we need it. But let's make sure that our positivity is anchored in reality in reality. Not in false hopes, not in pipe dreams, not in fate or luck, uh, not in a faith that we have in ourselves, not in just the power of positive thinking as if the more positive we think, good things will happen. Our positivity doesn't come to us because we're Americans either. Our positivity must be anchored in the Lord our God. Any other positivity is positively powerless. We must be anchored in the Lord our God. So last night, Mark Holt texted me to see if we were having church services today, and uh, he told me that his power had been out yesterday since 10 a.m., and I told him, man, that, that stinks. I hope they get your power back on soon. Some of you may have lost your power too yesterday, and he said it could be worse. It could be worse. And I was immediately reminded of Junior George, our friend, when he was dying of cancer, who I went to visit, and every time I went to visit him, he would say those same words. It could be worse. It could be worse. This is a world that we live in. Reality is that it could always be worse. But the truth of the matter is, it could also be better. <laughs> it could be worse, and it could be better. The truth of the matter is that it is what it is. Uh, and as we navigate life between what could be worse and what could be better, the key to living is where we have placed our hope. Where do you place your hope? Not just thinking positive thoughts, but knowing who God is. Knowing God makes all the difference, come what may. So we're continuing our series that we began last week online, which is entitled Character in Crisis. Last week, we talked about remain calm, and we looked at the story of Jesus and his disciples on the Sea of Galilee when a storm kicked up. And uh, the only way his disciples were ever going to remain calm in that situation was when they realized 
who it was that was in the boat with them. Once they realized the power and the authority of Jesus, who it was that was in the boat with them, then they would have the ability to think positive and to remain calm. This morning we turn to the words of the psalmist David that are found in Psalm 27. So you're going to want your Bible open to Psalm 27. The emphasis is, this morning, stay positive. Stay positive. Sounds good. Remain calm and stay positive when you face a crisis. But how can we stay positive when there's so much negativity around us? David shows us in Psalm 27 his secret. We know this about David. He is a man after God's own heart. God called him that. That was a name God gave him. A man after my own heart. He was the anointed king of Israel, anointed at a very young age as a shepherd boy. And he went through many negative experiences during his life, many challenges, many crises. But we remember that what we've been saying all along is that our character is refined and forged in crisis. One of the crises that David faced was he was being pursued by King Saul. King Saul was out to get him. King Saul wanted him dead. See, Saul was very paranoid, and he knew that David was very popular. And so Saul felt like David might come and take his throne, and so he began to chase after David. One of Saul's mercenaries was a man by the name of Doeg the Edomite. Not Dog the Bounty Hunter, but Doeg the Edomite. And um, the, actually the word for Edomite can also be translated the informer. So his name might actually be Doeg the informer. Doeg was loyal to Saul and he was a thorn in David's side. When David was fleeing from Saul, he was starving. And so he went to a group of priests and he found one priest in particular by the name of Ahimelech. And he asked Ahimelech for some food. Do you have any food here whatsoever? And Ahimelech said, well, the only thing I've got is a little bit of leftover bread from the worship service. Uh, this is the bread of the presence, uh, consecrated bread. David said, well, let me have that bread because I've got some starving men and we, we're, we're on the run and we need something to eat. So Ahimelech provided David with bread. While David was there, though, there was something else that was missing. He said, you know, I left in such a rush that I forgot any weapons. I don't have any weapons with me. And he asked the priest, you wouldn't have to have a weapon here, would you? And Ahimelech said, as a matter of fact, there is one weapon here. And it happens to be the sword of Goliath. You remember Goliath, right, David? Uh, and and that, that sword technically belongs to you, so you can have it. So Ahimelech gave David food for the road and a weapon. Very helpful man Ahimelech was to David. The book of 1 Samuel tells us in passing that there was someone standing in the shadows of the room that day as Ahimelech helped David. We read, Now one of Saul's servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. He was Doeg, the Edomite, the informer, Saul's chief shepherd. You might call him Saul's hitman, Saul's heavy, Saul's tough guy. So this little detail becomes kind of important as Saul continues pursuing David, because one day Doeg steps forward as an informant and tells Saul all about how Ahimelech has given aid to Saul's enemy, David. He's given David bread and a sword. And Saul is furious. And he commands his men to kill Ahimelech and all of the priests of Nob. None of Saul's men would do it. Out of respect for the priests, maybe out of respect for their religion, Hopefully, out of respect for the Lord, none of Saul's men would touch any of the priests, except for one man. We join the story in 1 Samuel chapter 22. The king then ordered Doeg, you turn and strike down the priests. Notice the command. Strike down the priests. 
So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. That day he killed 85 men who wore the linen ephod. He also put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests. So now not just the priests. With its men and women, its children and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. A little bit of overkill from Doeg the Edomite. But one son of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled to join David. He told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, That day when Doeg the Edomite was there, I knew he would be sure to tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of your whole family. Stay with me. Don't be afraid. The man who wants to kill you is trying to kill me too. You will be safe with me. You know, David even wrote a psalm about Doeg the Edomite, right? The spy of Saul, the killer of priests, the pursuer of David. So it's Psalm 52. The title that comes along with Psalm 52 in your Bibles is, For the director of music, a masculine of David, when Doeg the Edomite had gone to Saul and told him, David has gone to the house of Ahimelech. And I'm reading it to you now from the message version. Why do you brag of evil, big man? God's mercy carries the day. You scheme catastrophe. Your tongue cuts razor sharp, artisan in lies. You love evil more than good. You call black white. You love malicious gossip, you foul mouth. God will tear you limb from limb, sweep you up and throw you out, pull you up by the roots from the land of life. Good people will watch and worship. They'll laugh in relief. Big man bet on the wrong horse, trusted in big money, made his living from catastrophe. So you've got the picture now. We roll into Psalm 27. I get the idea that David is dealing with someone like Doeg, if not Doeg himself, in this psalm. This bad dude is tracking David down. So look at Psalm chapter 27, verse 2. It kind of sets the theme for us. David says, when the wicked advance against me to devour me. That's the situation that David is in. The wicked, the evildoers, are advancing against him to devour him. And the word for devour here brings to mind a lion that is stalking its prey, preparing to enjoy a meal. Kind of like the Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom that maybe you used to watch as a child Sunday night before church. And uh, yeah, the poor gazelles. <laughs> the, the poor gazelles. Always the weakest gazelle. The one in the back of the pack was the one that would get picked off. And then they'd show the lions smacking their tongues after their meal. You know, the New Testament warns us that there is an enemy who seeks to devour us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We are the gazelles. And Satan is after us. So make mo no mistake, the trials and the crises that we face are designed by the enemy to devour us. The Lord would like to use those same events to build us up, to refine and to forge your character. What Satan means for evil, God designs for good. Like David, you are being hunted. So let's look at how David is able to remain positive in spite of the fact that he's being pursued by evildoers who are out to get him. Does David extol the power of positive thinking? Is that how he's going to face the enemy? Well, he thinks positively, no doubt about it, but that's not the whole story. Does David lean on his experience, on his strength, on his previous victories? No, not really. David's ability to remain calm and stay positive doesn't come from anything within himself, but rather from the Lord God. And that's what we see in Psalm 27. The first word that David speaks in this psalm 
is Yahweh. Yahweh. The Lord God. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yahweh is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And that kind of reminds me of the New Testament verse that Norman Vincent Peale would have us to repeat. If God be for us, who can be against us? But it's not simply that positive thought that is powerful. It's not the repetition of those words that's powerful. It's the truth behind those words. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God is on my side, who could ever be powerful against us? In the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon teaches that a cord of three strands cannot be easily broken. I believe that David's description of the Lord God in this passage of Scripture is a cord of three strands. By concentrating on who God is, David is able to face the enemy with confidence. He's able to stay positive. So let's look at strand number one, which is the Lord is my radiance. The Lord is my radiance. You know, though we live in a negative world, a dark world, our God is light. He is pure radiance. And what does that light do for us? Well, you know, you stumble around in the darkness with no direction. You can't see an inch in front of your face in the darkness. But light illuminates the next step. It helps you to see direction, the path ahead of you. When darkness envelops your heart, you become down and you become discouraged and defeated. But then the light of the Lord shines in and brings hope and suddenly you can see the way ahead. You can see a way out. The darkness can become dreadful. It can become depressing. But light brings joy. I don't know about you, but I am so tired of this winter weather (laughs) and this winter darkness. I'm ready for spring. I'm ready for the light. I'm ready for the light to bring joy and warmth as it is capable of doing. You know, since the Lord is my radiance, he brings us guidance, he brings us hope, and he brings us joy in spite of the darkness. Describing the entrance of Jesus into the world, John wrote, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That is our God. And Matthew, echoing Isaiah, says of Jesus, The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. So we can stay positive when we know our Lord is the light. The Lord is my radiance. The second strand in this cord of three strands, the Lord is my rescue. The Lord is my rescue. David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And that word salvation has been so over-spiritualized that sometimes we need to just step away from it and be reminded that salvation simply means rescue. It means deliverance. David knows that the Lord is his salvation. No matter what terror surrounds him, it is the Lord who reaches out and saves him from the terror. You remember the story of Peter as he was stepping out of the boat to walk on the water with Jesus. As he looked into the eyes of Jesus, he was able to go over into the water and to walk temporarily on the water until he took his eyes off of Jesus and looked at the waves and, 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 and began to concentrate on his, himself. And then suddenly he began to sink into the sea. And he cries out to Jesus, Lord, save me. Rescue me. Of course, Jesus is more than just our Savior from the waves. He's more than just our Savior from a tight spot like David was in. By his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus Christ is our Savior from sin and death and eternal damnation. So the cry of the sinner is always, save me, save me. And when you come to the end of your rope and you recognize how lost you are and how dangerous the enemy is, you cry out to Jesus because you've lost all confidence in yourself. Save me. The Lord is my rescue. 
The third strand in this cord of three strands is the Lord is my refuge. David says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is the stronghold of my life. And the word for strength or stronghold here means a, a place of safety, a fortress, a place of protection, a refuge. It's kind of like a wildlife life refuge. It's, is where hunters are not welcome and animals are free to roam in safety. And David says, the Lord is my refuge. In the Lord, I have freedom. He is my safe place. I need not fear as long as I am in the Lord. So David says that as long as he is in the Lord, these evildoers, these enemies, and these foes, it says in verse 2, will be the ones who stumble and fall. These enemies and these foes, these evildoers will come against David. And because David is in the Lord and in the stronghold, he says, it's my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. They're, all of their plans will come to naught. Whatever schemes that they plan against David will come back upon them like a boomerang. Kind of like Wile E. Coyote. You remember watching those cartoons? His TNT always blew up in his own face. His traps always exploded on him. That's what David says about his enemies. They will be the ones who stumble and fall. So these are the three strands. The Lord is my radiance. The Lord is my rescue. The Lord is my refuge. And David says, as long as I'm rightly related to this God, as long as I'm walking with him, then I can remain positive. There is no fear when the Lord is your shepherd. Psalm 118, verse 6, David says, The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? I've got the Lord on my side. What is a mere mortal going to do? Isaiah 54, 17, the prophet says, No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. As, you, as long as you are on the side of the Lord, the side of truth, you cannot be harmed. So here in this psalm, in verse 3, David says, Though an army is deployed against me, my heart, my inner man, will not fear. He says, even though the battle rises up against me, even though there is war in my midst, even then, he says, I will be confident. I love that word confident. David says, I'm going to be confident. It means to be carefree, to be safe. Like a camper who hears a strange noise in the woods, but has a fresh set of D batteries in her flashlight. <laughs> like a child who's jumping into the deep end of the pool for the first time into the arms of daddy. Like the residents of a walled city. Impenetrable fortress. Safe and secure. David says, that is my God. I can be carefree and stay positive. Even... When I'm surrounded by a cruel world filled with evildoers and worrisome scenarios, this is David's position. And in verse 13 of this psalm, he gives his advice. We should listen up. Psalm 27, 13, he says, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is his confidence that God's going to win the day. And then he says in verse 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Trust in him. Rely on him. Be patient. Put your life in his hands. Stop worrying about the things that you can't control. Is this the power of positive thinking? Sure. Sure it is. But it's based in the truth of who God is. He is our light, our salvation, and our stronghold. I can be positive, and so can you, because our hope is anchored in the Lord our God. And nothing can threaten us when he is our light 
and our salvation and our stronghold. David's character was forged in times of crisis. So as a young man, you may remember this story, he brought lunch to his brothers on the battlefield. As he looked down on the battlefield, he saw this big man with a big mouth, Goliath. And Goliath was booming insults at the Israelites and at their God. And meanwhile, David's brothers and the rest of the army were all cowering in their tents. It's interesting how one of David's brothers, Eliab, gets mad at David. So we read in, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, right, it's the big shot, the oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him. And he asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? He's trying to insult his younger brother. He says, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. You just want some entertainment. You came to see some action. That's the only reason you came down here. Go back to your sheep, little man. Recognize this. Maybe Eliab was covering up for the fact that he himself was scared to death. That he himself was not willing to do anything to lift a hand against Goliath. So he took it out on his brother David. Fear breeds negativity. Fear breeds negativity. But you know, David was not discouraged by that at all. The next thing that Eliab sees is his little brother David, the little shepherd boy, heading down toward the battlefield with a slingshot and five stones and a staff. Now, what did Eliab have? Uh, what did David have that Eliab didn't? What was true of David in this moment that was not true of Eliab? Was it positive thinking? Well, yeah, it was some positive thinking. But David's positivity was anchored in the person of the Lord. That day, David said to Saul, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the paw of this Philistine as well. Get ready to see it. God is going to act. His faith was in the Lord. His character had been built in times of crisis. He had he now stood before a giant, carefree, confident, and positive. Knowing what David knew about the Lord, there was no way that he could lose in his mind. It's the power of positive thinking anchored in the person of God. Now, what do you know about the Lord? What do you know is true about the Lord? How has your faith been tested? How has your character been shaped and molded through the things that you have faced in your life. Have you faced any bears and lions in your life? Can you face the challenges and the crises in your life today, carefree and confident and positive because you believe in God? The Lord is your light and your salvation. Whom shall you fear? The Lord is the stronghold of your life. Of whom shall you be afraid? With David, no matter how negative things may seem, we need to proclaim, I remain confident in this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So hang on. Wait. Trust. Rely on the Lord. Good things are coming. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the fact that we can be positive in this life because we have a God who gives us hope and you are that God. We praise you and we thank you, O oh Lord, that we can step forward in this life through the challenges and the temptations and the trials that we face day by day and the evil that we see out there in the world around us. We can face it knowing that you are our radiance, that you are our rescue and you are our refuge. Help us, Lord, to trust in you in even deeper, stronger ways 
that we might be even more carefree and confident to live the Christian life in this world around us. Help us, Lord, to learn what it means to wait on you, to trust in you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we, um, as we close and sing, I give you my heart. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give. face this week but come what may we have a God who loves us and we are your children help us Lord to trust in you to rely on you to walk with you and stay positive Lord it's in Jesus name we pray amen